Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to the 2016 Patrick O'Meara International Lecture. This lecture series is named in honor of Indiana University's Vice President Emeritus of International Affairs, Patrick O'Meara, who retired in 2011 after more than three decades of highly meritor meritorious service to Indiana University. Over the course of his long and really truly distinguished career at Indiana University, Patrick worked tirelessly and effectively to support the university's global mission. And this lecture series in which distinguished speakers address critical topics in international affairs is an appropriate tribute to his legacy. It is also fitting that this year's lecturer is an Indiana University alumnus, Dr. Narendra Jadev, a member of the Indian Parliament and a distinguished economist and academic. Patrick will introduce Dr. Jadev at greater length in just a moment. And after the lecture, David Zarat, the Vice President for International Affairs and Patrick's successor, will moderate a question and answer period. And I'm delighted to welcome a number of special guests here this afternoon. And we are honored that Dr. Asif Saeed, the Consul General of India to Chicago, is with us today. Would you please join me in welcoming him? And I'm also very pleased that two members of Dr. Jadav's family are with us today as well. With us are his son, Tanmoy Jadav, and his four-year-old grandson, Agustya, who no doubt you have seen. So would you please join me in welcoming both of them as well. And we're also joined today by a number of friends and family members of Patrick O'Meara, and I will ask them to stand as I introduce them, and I also ask that you hold your applause until all are introduced. With us today are Patrick's nephew, Tim O'Meara, Tim's wife, Bridget, and their daughter, Fiora. And also with us are a number of, please join me in welcoming them too, please. And also with us are a number of Patrick's longtime friends and colleagues, former Assistant Vice President for International Affairs, Judy Rice, Patrick's Executive Assistant, Edda Callahan, and his friends, Daniel and Mary Carpenter. Please join me in welcoming all of them as well. And I'm also delighted to welcome the Provost of the Bloomington Campus and Indiana University Executive Vice President, Lauren Robel, and Ambassador Lee Feinstein, Founding Dean of the School of Global and International Studies, and a, himself a former O'Meara lecturer. So please join me in wel welcoming them as well. <laughs> Undoubtedly, many of you are well acquainted with the man for whom this lecture series is named. But before I invite him to the podium, let me say just a few words about Patrick O'Meara and his distinguished career at Indiana University. Patrick came to IU from South Africa in 1960. And he came here as a graduate student and he earned masters and doctoral degrees in political science with a speciality in African politics. In 1970, he began his teaching career at IU as a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. In 1972, he received a tenure-track appointment in the then newly established School of Public and Environmental Affairs. He very quickly developed a reputation as an outstanding scholar in the areas of international development, comparative politics, and African politics. Among his many publications is the multidisciplinary survey, just called Africa, which is a now classic textbook that has been used by nearly 100 universities and colleges around the world. The hundreds of students who he has taught, advised and mentored over the years have taken their place as the next generations of political scientists and scholars, and they lead and serve on the faculties of departments of political science in universities across the nation. In 1972, Patrick also became director of the African Studies Program, a role in which he served for more than two decades. Because of his extensive knowledge of Africa and his expertise in the continent's politics, Patrick has been called 
upon to testify before congressional committees, including the House Foreign Relations Committee and the House Committee on Post-Secondary Education. In 1993, Patrick became the Dean of International Programs. And in 2007, when I became president of IU, I created the new position of Vice President for International Affairs because of the rapidly increasing importance of the international and global dimension of higher education. Patrick, of course, was the natural person to serve as IU's first Vice President for International Affairs. Among his many accomplishments in that role, he led the, the effort to create the university's first international strategic plan, which in turn was one of the first of its kind in the nation, and one that has served as a model for many other institutions. For his dedication to international partnership and higher education, Patrick has been recognized with the Cross of St. George, awarded in Spain, the Warsaw University Medal, the Amicus Polonae from the, from the Embassy of Poland, an honorary doctorate from the National Institute of Development Administration in Thailand, and the Gold Cross of Merit of the Republic of Hungary. Indiana University has awarded Patrick the Thomas Hart Benton Medal, the IU John Ryan Award, and the IU Distinguished Service Award. And I had the honor and pleasure of presenting him with the President's Medal for Excellence in 2011 at the inaugural Patrick Amira International Lecture. Though he officially retired in 2011, Patrick graciously agreed to continue serving the university as a special advisor to the President, for which I am most grateful. This lecture series is the most fitting way to honor all that he has given to Indiana University and to his students, colleagues, and friends over many, many years. So would you join me, would you join me please in welcoming to the podium, Patrick O'Meara. Thank you, Michael. Your presidency has been extraordinary in so many ways, but I just thought I'd give you a personal insight today on something you accomplished. When I enter the architecturally innovative SGIS building most days to go to my office on the fourth floor, or when I participate in the activities of the new school, I realize that none of this would have been possible without your vision and guidance, and also the magic way in which you found the money. <laughs> I remember the first time the building was introduced, you asked me to launch a statement at the Board of Trustees meeting. And I did so, but with a lot of doubt, I regret to say, I wondered, was this going to happen? I thought it would, but I never dreamt it would happen so quickly. I shouldn't have doubted. This is just one of your great achievements, and I thank you for it because I enjoy it every day. Thank you for your continuing commitment to the lecture series. Thank you also, David, David Zaret, for your help with the lecture and all of the previous ones. And to Margaret Key, who has watched over all the details, she has my gratitude. So today, I'm delighted to do this introduction for an extraordinary visitor. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Narendra Jadav, economist, policymaker, educationist, social scientist, best-selling author, and above all, Indiana graduate. And I've done some looking into your years at IU, and I'm really pleased to see that you received an award from the economics department for a research paper on economic theory. And in addition, that you were recognized by the associate dean for international students as being one of the outstanding international students. I remember a previous visit of yours in 2007 when I realized you had something really special going on. You were followed around the campus by a movie team. <laughs> Everywhere you went, everyone you spoke to, they were documenting you, your family, and his career. After completing your degree, you moved on to India, you served in the Reserve Bank for 31 years, and you became someone also involved with the International Monetary Fund, D 
dealing with Afghanistan and Ethiopia. I was privileged to visit you in another of your capacities when you were Vice Chancellor of the University of Pune, one of India's great universities. I remember the impressive campus, but I was even more impressed because you told me, I'm arranging for 700,000 saplings to be planted. That was a great thing to, to hear. So an impressive campus, but also an impressive mission in which you made an effort to reach out to the surrounding communities. In addition to the administrative work, he's been a prolific writer with research papers in English, Marathi, and Hindi, and a book on the great, great Dalit reformer, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, the great Dalit political figure in the history of the country, and of course also your studies of Tagore. You're known, of course, to millions of people in India because of your great book on the odyssey of your family. Um, you went from Pune to government to become a significant figure, a member of the National Planning Commission with the rank of Minister of State, and from there uh, you went on to work with Mrs. Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi, on the National Advisory Council, dealing with some really important issues of skills, development, labor, and so on. At this point, I want to go beyond the resume for just a few moments, because I've really been impressed over the past weeks reading your book, and I want to try and capture the animating spirit of you and of your family. All our lives are made up of journeys. Every journey that we take is a journey into ourselves, and often journeys are more than simply traveling over space. Ultimately, they are modes of discovery and sometimes about change. Appropriately, the subtitle of your book, The Untouchables, is My Family's Triumph, a triumphal journey out of the caste system in modern India. I find the word triumph very moving. Your journeys and the journeys of your family are ones of profound transformation. The introduction to the book sets out what this was all about. And it's incredible for me to look at this and realize that every sixth human being in the world today is an Indian. Every sixth Indian is an untouchable Dalit. We are struggling against caste, discrimination, illiteracy, and poverty. And our weapons are education, empowerment, and democracy. The most remarkable journey was the journey of your father. And I found it incredibly moving. The decision to leave the village and the preordained life, the decision not to perform a, a, a horrendous task demanded of you, and the courage to reach out and say, no more of the caste system, and to reject it. And equally monumental was the decision, which I read with great sense of the tremendous journey this was involved with, the decision to convert to Buddhism. And it's a really beautiful story where your family goes on a long train journey to witness the public conversion of Dr. Ambaid Kaur in a big ceremony, beautifully written, and the decision then that your family would convert. From the text, I thought about crossing a different kind of border. We're going to leave the boundaries of Hinduism and enter the new religion of equality, compassion, and understanding, which is vividly expressed. Your father had another journey in mind for you, and that was education for you and your family. That was the great journey to fulfill the dream. And your mother also had a journey, which I'm touched by, a long journey. She talks about walking in the shadow of your father, walking behind him, unquestionably following his foot, in his footsteps. And then she says, over the years, he told me to think and question, encourage me to debate and argue with me for the sake of arguing and because it amused me to see him defy me. What a remarkable statement. 
your journey was to Bloomington. And I was touched because as you embarked on that journey, your father wept. But he didn't weep out of sorrow. He wept because he got everything that he wanted and he said he was now ready to die. There have been many more journeys you've taken to Washington, D.C. with the International Monetary Fund. And even other journeys. And your mother kept questioning, why do you take all these journeys? And then with a mo moment of realism, she said, well, you've been like this ever since you were a child. Of course, the journeys continue, as do the barriers, because there are still the great barriers in India, even though the emerging Dalit middle class is now there. You wrote something, and I want to conclude with just a few thoughts on this. You said, the bottom line always stood out. I was a mere Mahar, a Dalit, belonging to the lowest breakdown of society. It was always as if I had a tragic flaw inherited through birth, no matter what I did, where I went, or what success I achieved. I would always be looked upon as an untouchable, albeit one who had achieved success. I don't look upon you as an untouchable, and millions of people no longer think of that even when we meet with you and read your books and look at you on television. You've cast off the shackles that you referred to. The education brought you another kind of recognition. I'm really delighted that you are this year's distinguished lecturer, and I'm delighted that your family has come on a journey on this return visit. Please join me in welcoming Narendra. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for the most generous and uh, the most beautiful introduction that I have ever received. President uh, Michael McRobbie, Vice President Emeritus of International Affairs, Patrick O'Meara, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure, as well as an honor, to have been invited to deliver here the sixth annual Patrick O'Meara International Lecture today. I'm grateful to President McRobbie and Mr. Patrick O'Meara for giving me the opportunity to deliver this lecture and to revisit my alma mater, Indiana University. Indiana University has not only given me a PhD degree, the university has given me my entire academic orientation and grounding. This great institution and this great place, Bloomington, carries a lot of fond memories uh, for me and for my family. And that is precisely why my only son, Tanmay, is with me here. And my only grandson, Agastya, both of them have joined me in this event today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to share some thoughts this afternoon on the theme, India and the United States cast race and economic growth. Friends, you will agree with me that this is a rather heavy subject for a popular lecture. This is a subject which is probably suitable for a PhD dissertation. Uh, and I, in fact, I have a speech. I could not stop when I got involved in this subject. And I have written a rather long speech, 52 pages long. And I promise you, I will not read uh, it all. But I would like to focus on some of the key aspects and provide further details wherever necessary in the Q&A. Uh, but I must say that I crave your indulgence today and allow me to speak uh, in a rapid fire and 
take about 45 minutes instead of 30 minutes that was assigned to me. Well, friends, uh, India and United States, uh, two largest democracies in the world, the U.S. has the biggest democracy in terms of the economic size, and India as the most populous democracy. These two great democracies have had very different histories. In the United States, democracy was established against the backdrop of a new and expanding frontier society in a young nation that was seen as a land of opportunity. In contrast, democracy in India was established in an old civilization characterized by caste-ridden, hierarchical society and a completely stagnant economy. In both democracies, India and United States, official discourses typically emphasize the notion of tolerance and openness. For example, the unity and diversity argument in India and uh, the melting pot or mosaic idea in United States. In reality, however, despite dissimilar historical backgrounds and what the two demo despite dissimilar historical backgrounds what the two democracies do have in common is a long history of stigmatization discrimination and disenfranchisement against a large segment of their own people in the united states the most stigmatized and long marginalized group is African Americans. According to 2010 census, out of the total population of 309 million, they were, there were 37 million African Americans. While in India, there are two large stigmatized groups. One is untouchables, also called Dalits, also called scheduled caste. They constitute about 203 million people. And the second one is Adivasis, or Aboriginals, also called Scheduled Tribes, and they comprise about 104 million people. In other words, in fact, according to the 2010 census, the combined population of Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribes in India today, or in 2010, equaled the entire population of United States in that year. Let me begin by talking about race and caste as institutions. Race and caste both are essentially institutions of systematic social stratification. In some respects, they are, they are strikingly similar, especially towards those at the receiving end. Nevertheless, there are some fundamental differences between them as well. First, the similarities. In the 1930s and in 1940s, American social anthropologists, uh, especially Lloyd Warner and others, they were so much influenced by the similarity between the caste in India and the, uh, and the, and, and the race in the uh, United States that they started using the metaphor of caste while discussing the racial cleavages in United States, calling, giving it a new name, color caste system. In both systems, the Indian caste system and the color caste system in the United States, Social groups are differentiated from each other based on hereditary membership, which fixes the social status of individuals at birth and prevents movement from one group to another. The most striking difference between the two is this, that the color caste system in the United States is based on social recognition, whereas the caste system in India has been based on a religious sanction. The American color caste system is said to be disharmonic in the sense that inequalities exist in practice, although they have been rejected by the normative moral order. On the other hand, the Indian system is harmonic in the sense that the rigid social distinctions not only exist but because of the religious sanctity behind them, they were generally accepted as legitimate. That is the difference between the two. Both untouchables or Dalits in India and African Americans in the United States did not inherit 
socio-political conditions that would allow them to carve out for themselves uh, a place for themselves in the respective mainstream. Both of these social groups have had to put up a fight. They had to organize and struggle for mainstreaming. The Dalit struggle for equality in India and the African-American struggle in the United States, they have shared common ground in several respects. And I would like to give you a quick uh, backdrop of that, uh, beginning with the caste system in India. Uh, as some of you might know, Hindus believe that God created the caste system. The sacred book of Hindus, the Rig Veda, which is, dates back to about 1,000 years before Christ, it describes how the human stratification came about. According to that theory, a cosmic giant called Purusha, he sacrificed parts of his body to create the mankind. His mouth became Brahmin, the priestly class. His arms became Kshatriya, the warriors and the landowners. His thighs were made into Vaishya, which is the merchant's uh, class. And from the feet were born Shudra, the servant class. This fourfold classification or stratification is called Chatur Varni. And untouchables, they had no place even in these four Varna. They were placed even below the lowest of the Varna, that is the Varna of Shudra. Ancient Hindu books, such as Manusmruti, did not allow Shudras, that is the fourth Varna, and untouchables to possess any wealth at all. And the doors of education were also closed on them. This fourfold classification of society, Chaturvarni, and the untouchables were further divided into more than 3,000 castes and sub caste and sub sub caste with a mind boggling differentiation built into the hierarchy. The caste is the defining factor in determining the course of one's life. Whether one becomes a scholar or whether one becomes a scavenger depended on his or her caste. Sir, you were referring to uh, me coming out of... I may have come out, but others haven't. You know, uh, the other day, a few months back, somebody described me as a Dalit economist. You know, I said, I wrote to the newspaper, the leading newspaper, I said, I am a Dalit and I am an economist, but for God's sake, don't create a new caste called Dalit economist. <laughs> but that happens day in and day out. In this system of graded inequality in the caste, there was no scope for a reward. How could mere mortals challenge the structure ordained by the God himself? Religious sanctity had ensured the unquestioned perpetuation of the age-old system for a long time, with some notable exceptions. Gautam Buddha was one exception. That was from the 5th century before Christ to about 6th century AD. And Bhakti movement was another revolt, mild revolt, against the caste system in the 13th century. What happened was, with the advent of the British Raj in India around the early 19th century, education, which was once a privilege of the upper caste alone, that gradually became accessible to the caste lower down the hierarchy. Knowledge brought with it desire to be recognized and to be respected. It strengthened the resolve of the downtrodden to struggle against caste-based dis discrimination. In the United States, when Thomas Jefferson wrote, in the, wrote the Declaration of Independence in 1776, stating that, and I'm sure all of you know that, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their created with inherent and unalienable rights, and so on. This statement must have been a music to the years of social reformers in India, in addition to that in the United States. In 1863, when President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which paved the way for abolishment of slavery in the United States, 
it had a resonance in India as well. Now I'm going to tell you something very strange. Within a decade after Emancipation Proclamation came, Mahatma Jyotiba Phule, Mahatma is the title. In India, only two persons in the long history have got this title, Mahatma. Mahatma means great soul. First was Mahatma Phule, and the second was Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi himself had said that the real Mahatma in our country has only been Mahatma Phule. That Mahatma Phule, who was a teacher in a Christian school, who came from a lowly gardener community, established the first non-Brahmin social organization. Interestingly, Mahatma Phule described the conditions of Dalits and Shudras in India as one of slavery, comparing the historic disenfranchisement of untouchables in India with slavery in United States. Indeed, his magnum opus that he wrote in the year 1873, that was barely a decade, 10 years after the proclamation uh, was signed, uh, that magnum opus of Mahatma Phule was called Gulam Giri, which means literally means slavery. And what was the dedication of this book? 1873 we are talking about, and I'm going to read out the dedication. Mahatma Phule says, dedicated to the good people of the United States as a token of admiration for their sublime, disinterested, and self-sacrificing devotion in the cause of Negro slavery, and with an earnest desire that my countrymen may take their noble example as their guide in the emancipation of their Shudra brethren from the trammels of Brahmin thraldom, unquote. This is what happened in 1873. Mahatma Phule emphasized the education for masses, exactly the same way it happened in the United States. He educated his wife Savitri, who started the first ever school for girls in India against all odds. And over the years, Mahatma Phule established many schools for untouchables and for women, which laid the groundwork for a massive social change that followed. In fact, another piece, interesting piece is that when the Prince of Wales visited India in 1889, he was greeted on the streets in India with signs, the signs read, tell the grandma, the grandma here of course is Queen Victoria, tell the grandma we are a happy nation, but 190 million without education. This was the beginning of social revolution in India. In the meantime, in the United States, following a short period of reconstruction and after abolition, after the abolition of slavery in the 1860s, discrimination against the African Americans reemerged in the form of black courts and Jim Crow laws around 1877 and continued well into the mid middle of the 20th century. The black courts and the Jim Crow laws in effect, discriminated against African Americans much the same way as Manusmriti did against untouchables in India. Despite the historical and cultural differences, African Americans in the United States and untouchables in India suffered from similar forms of suppression and servitude. The late 19th century United States saw the emergence of two most influential African-American leaders, Booker T. Washington and William Du Bois, whose approaches to the racial problem in the United States turned out to be diagonally, uh, diametrically opposite. William Du Bois became the leading intellectual spokesperson of the African-American struggle in the first half of the 20th century, as all of you know. His contemporary in India was Mahatma Gandhi, born in India in 1869, just one year after Du Bois, William Du Bois's birth in the United States. Mahatma Gandhi became the supreme commander of India's freedom struggle. Regarded as the father of nation, Mahatma Gandhi has been uniquely placed as modern India's moralistic ideal, uh, who also fought in his own unique style the war against untouchability. Mahatma Phule died in the year 1890, 
within a year thereafter, another great son of India was born, and this time it was from an untouchable family. His name was what was mentioned by, by you, sir, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar's life is an incredible saga. An untouchable boy, humiliated at every step of the way from childhood to his youth, beats all odds, securing PhD in economics from Columbia University. The year was 1917. Then he gets Doctor of Science degree in economics from London School of Economics in 1923, besides a barrister's degree from London. He then returned to India and devoted his life to the destruction of the caste-ridden old order. Dr. Ambedkar overcame the bitter political opposition and perils of caste discrimination to become the principal architect of the Indian constitution when India became republic in 1950. And it was Dr. Ambedkar who became a valiant champion of human rights and an emancipator of untouchables in India who dedicated all his life to awaken the social conscience of modern India. There are, there are striking parallels between William Du Bois and Booker T. Washington on one hand and Dr. Ambedkar and Mahatma Gandhi on the other. And not only in terms of their scholarship, but also in terms of their approaches in dealing with the racial and the caste-based discrimination problems respectively. By the way, before I proceed on that, I want to add that Dr. Ambedkar compared the two systems to inhuman institutions, slavery and caste system, and he called untouchables in India as the children of India's ghetto. Children of India's ghetto was the description that Ambedkar gave about untouchables. Uh, just like, just as William Du Bois awakened the African Americans through his writings in NAACP mouthpiece called The Crisis, Dr. Ambedkar created mass awareness among the untouchables through a series of fortnightly journals. Like Du Bois and Washington, Dr. Ambedkar firmly believed in education as a great transformational device. In fact, when Dr. Ambedkar founded his first social organization in 1924, after return with the higher education, the motto of that organization was educate, organize, and agitate. And that remained his motto for everything that he did in life. More like Booker T. Washington than like William Du Bois, for the first 10 years in public life, that is from 1924 to 1934, Dr. Ambedkar's strategy for mass movement was to fight for civic rights for untouchables while remaining within the fold of Hindu religion. The first two mass movements that he launched one was for accessing water from a public reservoir, and the second one was for temple entry movement. The, the years were 1927 and 1930, respectively. A high point of this protest and agitation was ceremonious burning, public burning of the holy book, Manusmruti, which had traditionally governed the laws and life of Hindus. Dr. Ambedkar challenged the authority of Hindu scriptures because the Chaturvarnya, and the caste system derived its sanctity from the religious books. Dr. Ambedkar felt that Manusmruti, while it was a charter of rights for the so-called upper caste Hindus, he said it was a Bible of slavery for the untouchables. And therefore, on December 25th, the Christmas day on 1927, Manusmruti was publicly burned, which heralded a fight for equality and social justice. So for the first 10 years, Dr. Ambedkar remained within the Hindu fold and tried to reform the religion from within. But at the end of 10 years, he was very frustrated with his efforts and he realized that the Hindu religion is unchangeable and that reform cannot take place. And therefore, he made a dramatic announcement, historic announcement in October 1935. He announced a breakaway from Hinduism. His words were, I was born a Hindu untouchable. That was not in my hands. But I'm not going to die as a Hindu. In other words, he announced that he was going to convert into another religion. He did not do that right away. In fact, 
21 years later, 21 years later in 1956, barely 50 days before his death, Dr. Ambedkar converted himself into Buddhism and along with him 700,000 people were converted into Buddhism. Uh, it is very important to note that this is the only instance as far as I know in the world history where such a large scale conversion took place without the pressure of the sword or without any financial incentive. Only on the words of one individual, Dr. Ambedkar, 700,000 people, my parents included, they converted themselves into Buddhism. Dr. Ambedkar embraced Buddhism rather than any other religion because he saw Buddha's religion as being based on liberty, equality, fraternity, and social justice. There is a parallel here again that some African Americans have converted into Islam, uh, but that has been on a much smaller scale than the massive scale on which it happened in India. From October 1935 onwards, Dr. Ambedkar's strategy looked more like the strategy of William Du Bois rather than that of Booker T. Washington. In other words, he started insisting on social, on full civil rights and increased participation representation for untouchables. To an extent, the disagreement between Booker T. Washington and George du uh, William Du Bois resonates with divergence between Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Ambedkar in their approaches. Although in both cases, arguably, the ultimate goal was one and the same. For example, William Du Bois initially had sent congratulatory messages to Booker T. Washington for his Atlanta exposition, exposition speech, but later he opposed Washington's Atlanta compromise in the strongest possible terms. In the similar manner, Dr. Ambedkar, who was much younger, than Mahatma Gandhi, 32, 22 years younger than him. Initially, he appreciated, acknowledged the contribution of Mahatma Gandhi, but later was completely opposed to everything that Mahatma Gandhi did. In fact, when there were, there were three roundtable conferences organized in 1931 and 32 by the British government uh, in the process of giving freedom to, uh, to India, uh, in that, those conferences, particularly in the second roundtable conference in 1931, there was a public acrimonious exchange between Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Ambedkar, and the issue was the separate electorates. You know, Mahatma Gandhi was insisting that there would be no separate electorates for Dalits. Dr. Ambedkar was saying, Mahatma Gandhi was saying that I do not mind giving separate electorates to Christians, to Muslims, but I will never give allow separate electorates for Dalits. Dr. Ambedkar insisted on separate electorates. There was an acrimonious, acrimonious exchange between the two, and finally they left the issue to be decided by the British government. Mahatma Gandhi was fully convinced that the verdict would, would have to be in his favor because he was the national leader of a great eminence. As it turned out, six months later, when the verdict came from the British government, it completely favored Dr. Ambedkar and not Mahatma Gandhi. All of them had given in writing, including Mahatma Gandhi, that whatever is the verdict by the British government, we, will, we shall abide by that. But when the verdict went against Mahatma Gandhi, he changed his mind and announced a fast unto death. He was jailed at that time in Pune, Airwada jail in Pune. And from the jail, he announced fast unto death. And that put a lot of pressure on Dr. Ambedkar. The whole country went against him because the life of Mahatma was in the hands of Dr. Ambedkar. So Dr. Ambedkar, in whose favor the judgment had gone, he was pressurized to withdraw his demand for separate electorates. Finally, there was a compromise reached, which is called Pune Karar or Pune Pact. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Ambedkar had socio-economic visions which were poles apart. In fact, they had deeply divergent conceptions of the India as a nation. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi looked upon the traditional Chaturvarnaya, the fourfold stratification, as an ideal model of organization which assigns to each individual social and occupational vocation, thereby ensuring that collectively the system functions harmoniously. Within that framework, Gandhiji believed that prevalence of various castes contributed towards social harmony and economic stability. Mahatma Gandhi tended to romanticize the village life in India, 
where people had limited needs and they happily worked in their traditional meaning caste based occupation dr ambedkar could not have disagreed more he called villages as cesspools that harbored caste based oppression and socio economic backwardness he looked upon caste system as a system of graded inequality with ascending order of reverence and descending order of contempt which had done irreparable damage he said to the indian society dr ambedkar had argued that the fourfold stratification in the indian system in terms of chaturvarnya was not merely a division of labor as was argued by mahatma gandhi but superimposed on division of labor was division of laborers while the division of labor is a time honored principle of economics division of laborers based on the accident of birth is not and he said that this division which was implicit in chaturvarnya was not based on choice nor was it based on talent or capacity or experience it was simply dependent on the accident of birth which made it completely unnatural was there a connection between dr ambedkar and william du bois their their work is so much similar and i was looking frantically to see whether there was any connect between the two and i found very interesting uh, reference in 1945 when william du bois was a member of the three person delegation from naacp delegation that attended the conference in which united nations were established united nations was established the naacp delegation wanted united nations to endorse rational racial equality they wanted un to endorse racial equality interestingly on july 2 1946 dr ambedkar had written a letter to william du bois and i have seen that letter exploring the possibility of taking the question of untouchables to the newly formed united nations regrettably nothing came out of that during the 1950s and 60s when there was a civil rights movements several leaders from the african american community rose to prominence arguably the most important one among them was martin luther king junior interestingly martin luther king junior was inspired by mahatma gandhi's non violent activism and civil disobedience movement he even visited india in 1959 and that visit seems to have influenced him in a deeply profound manner no wonder the civil rights movement led by him extensively used non violent methods during their protest india attained the independence on 15th august 1947 and it became a republic on january 26 1950 as a matter of historical justice the drafting of the indian constitution was entrusted to a former untouchable and that was dr b r ambedkar as the principal architect of the indian constitution dr ambedkar formally abolished untouchability and built safeguards of affirmative action for establishing a more equitable society that is capable of delivering social justice to the millions thus heralding in india a new era of social equality and rationalism social reforms always and everywhere is a process not an event dalit intellectuals continue to invoke the african american experience in their articulation of dalit struggle in the 1970s a military group of uh, sorry a militant group of ex untouchable writers and thinkers in maharashtra that is the province where i belong they invoked black panthers in naming themselves dalit panthers so on the lines of black panther in the 70s there was a movement of dalit panther dalits in india continue to wage a war as uh, patrick was saying uh, war against the caste discrimination illiteracy and poverty and their weapons are democracy education and self empowerment dalits once rendered untouchables are finding their voice indeed they are mounting a slow but steady rebellion just as african americans are fighting an uphill and long drawn struggle for mainstreaming in the united states reverend jesse jackson senior had reportedly once said don't judge me from where i stand judge me from where i'm coming from 
Dalits today, Dalits like me today, are saying exactly the opposite. Don't judge us from where we are coming from. Judge us from where we stand today. So that is the situation, and that is the uh, comparison and the parallels and contrast between the struggle for equality in India and in United States. Let me now turn to the final part where I talk about the social exclusion, discrimination, and economic outcomes. But before that, I must have a, a glass of water. I want to relate all this now to economic growth. Race and caste are both essentially the institutions of systematic social stratification. More often than not, social stratification leads to exclusion and dis discrimination. Question that arises is whether social exclusion and discrimination may it be coming for, from racism or from casteism, does it really matter for economic growth? And if so, how much? For a long time, these questions were addressed primarily by sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, and historians. Until recently, these social scientists did not include economists. Come to think of it, it's hardly surprising, because this was so because the conventional neoclassical theory has been developed on the assumption that the social group identities of economic agents may it be producers, consumers, employers, employees, social identity of economic agents do not matter in the market. That is the basic presumption. In reality, however, any exclusion, any discrimination, irrespective of its origin, pervades every aspect of society. Group identities influence attitudes and social relations and are therefore invariably reflected in economic outcomes such as incomes, wages, credit extended, and ultimately in the overall economic growth. Not much work has been done there until recently, but now there is uh, a whole stream of specialized literature, Kenneth Arrow has called it specialized literature, that now exists, which aims at demonstrating how social identities of economic agents can in fact be central to the determination of relevant economic outcome. And there are all kinds of theories, but the two main theories which talk about this uh, are the statistical discrimination theory and the test for discrimination theory. According to the statistical discrimination theory, which is developed by Arrow, Phelps, Akerlof, and so on, uh, discrimination takes place because of the imperfect information in the labor markets. Illustratively, Employers cannot easily adjust productivity of their prospective employees and hence cannot determine what wages to offer them without incurring a cost to major productivity. Given this lack of perfect and costless statistical information, the theory suggests that employers use proxies instead based on social convention. The other theory, uh, other economic model of discrimination is the test for discrimination theory which was developed by Becker. It suggests that discrimination can simply be explained by an individual prejudice, by a test for discrimination. Uh, these theories, while there is no doubt that these theories convincingly demonstrate that social identities do matter for economic outcomes, even in most strongly market-oriented situations, it must be noted that the two theories confine themselves to market-based discrimination alone to differences in wages and occupations in labor markets. In reality, discrimination against socially excluded groups, such as African Americans or Dalits in India, is not limited to marketplace alone. These groups face discrimination in almost every walk of life, and the process of discrimination begins much before the excluded group even enters the labor market. In other words, in order to link race and caste with economic growth in India and United States, one will have to go beyond market discrimination and take a holistic view of the pernicious effect of race and caste on the respective economies. Now, let me make some quick observation about 
the growth story of United States and growth story of India and how race and caste are involved in that, particularly for the future. And this is based on work done by a lot of great scholar, great economists. If you look at the long-term growth story of United States, the following observations can be made. There was virtually no growth in the United States before the year 1750. Output per head, per capita, began to grow only after 1750. This is based on uh, Robert Gordon's work. Uh, it reached its fastest rate in the middle of 20th century, and then it has slowed down since. If you look, take a lo very long-term view, it took the United States 500 years to double the standard of living from year 1300 to, seven, uh, to eight, 1800. Then the pace accelerated. After that, it took them 100 years to double per capita income between the year 1800 and 1900. The fastest doubling of standard of living took place in only 28 years, and the years were 1929 to 1957. After that, there was a slowdown, somewhat slower doubling. Uh, it, it took 31 years from 1957 to 1988, and going by his estimate, Robert Gordon's estimate, is that between 1987 and 2007, uh, the growth rate of uh, per capita income was only 1.8 percent per year, which meant that it would have to, it would have would take United States 40 years to double the per capita income. This pace of economic growth in United States since the year 1750 is uh, said to be a result of three industrial revolutions. Uh, uh, first about the steam engines, second one about electricity, and third one was computer and internet revolution. The question that is important for this theme today is, could this growth path would have been any different had there been no lingering racial divide in the United States? Would closing the social and racial and ethnic gaps have yielded concrete economic gains for the United States? Robert Lynch and Patrick Oakford study in 2013, 2013 report titled All in Nation, an America that works for all, provides some tentative answers. This study quantifies the economic cost of racial and ethnic inequalities by providing estimates of what the United States would have looked like in year 2011 if, and there is a big if there, if all racial and ethnic groups had earned the same medium income adjusted for age differences. According to this study, if racial and ethnic disparities in the United States were eliminated, the GDP of the United States would have been at least 1.2 trillion US dollars more, 8 percent more in 2011, instead of 15.1 trillion dollars at 2005 prices, it would have been 16.3 trillion US dollars. It would have also meant that the poverty ratio in the United States, which was 15% in 2011, would have come down to 10.8%. It would have also meant 6.8 million African Americans would have come out of, uh, lifted from the level of poverty, and 6.1 million Hispanics also would have been lifted out of the poverty. What about the future? Very bleak scenario has been drawn by Robert Gordon. Even if the innovation that took place in the last two decades continued to take place, he says that the long-term economic growth in the United States would be considerably smaller than in the past. And he attributes the slowdown. He says that the growth rate would be only 1.8% for the next 20 years. And he says that there are six headwinds that the US economy has to face. One is demography which is reversal of uh, the demographic dividend. Second is education, in terms of low education attainment. Third is rising income inequality. Fourth is globalization. Fifth is energy or environment. And sixth one is overhang of consumer and government debt. Out of these six headwinds, the first three, namely demography, uh, education, and income inequality, these three are directly related to the racial composition of United States. According to Gordon, even if only these three headwinds are taken into account, the growth rate which is going to slow down to 1.8 percent, if not, if not corrected for these three headwinds, it would go down further to less than 1 percent. 0.9 percent is the figure that he says. 
Uh, you, can, you can take a closer look at demography, education, and in, income inequalities. Uh, there is a lot of data available there. But basically, what happened was between 1965 to 1990, there was a demographic dividend, a large, there was a major movement of females into the labor force. But what is happening is that baby boomers are now retiring. According to one study, every day 10,000 people, mostly white, are turning 65, and it has been projected by the year 2025, majority of baby boomers would have exited the labor force. By the year 2041, white Americans will be in a minority in the US population, and by the year 2045, white Americans will be a minority in the US labor force. Uh, while the US labor force faces the serious shortage of workforce, Fortuitously, this workforce shift is projected to coincide with communities of color growing as a proportion of the US population. In fact, by the year 20, 2050, combined share of African Americans and Hispanics is projected to rise to 42% of the US population from 27% in the year 2010. Educational attainment, several studies have shown uh, that educational attainment in the United States reached its plateau nearly 25 years ago and has been slipping down the international league tables. The, the numbers about the achievement gaps are alarming, uh, but what is important here is to note that between the year 2010 to 2020, it was projected that two-thirds of all American job, job openings will require some post-secondary education. Yet, in the year 2010, only 58% of African Americans and only 38% of Hispanics had that level of attainment. Uh, the Center for Education and, and the Workforce at Georgetown University has estimated that by the year 2018, 45% of all jobs will require an associate degree or more. Yet, in 2012, only 27% African Americans and 26% of US-born Latinos and 14% Latino immigrants had that level of education. The Gordon study also makes a very important point that the most important factor holding down the future income growth of United States is rising inequality. And he quotes Emmanuel Saiz uh, saying that between the period 1993 to period 2008, the average real household income growth was only 1.3%, whereas the bottom 99% population growth for them the growth was only 0.75%, less, much less than 1%. And in fact, the top 1% of the income distribution captured as much as 52% of the income gains during the 15-year period. This is really a serious situation. In some about the United States, let me say this, that while the projected slowdown of the United States economic growth is a big challenge, the shifting of racial demographies, uh, demographics offer the United States an opportunity to live up to the ideals upon which it was founded. That the US would be a nation of many different communities, each empowered by opportunities and the potential to fully contribute to building a strong nation. Needless to say that to make this American dream a reality, public policies in the United States would have to reflect the racial diversity and represent the interest of all rather than just a select few. Few observations on the India's growth story. India's long-term growth story, uh, there is a lot that has been written with the seminal work done by Professor Angus Madison. Uh, surprising as it is, it would be for many of you. Uh, you know, he has estimated, Angus Madison has estimated, India's GDP from the year one, year 500, year 1000, and so on. Uh, it shows that when the Gregorian calendar began, in the year one, India's share, India was slightly larger than what it is today, India's share in the global production was as high as 31.5%. Uh, it came down precipitously uh, uh, later years, but interestingly, in the year 1700, it is hard to believe, but the per capita income of India was larger, substantially larger than the per capita income of the United States. Uh, but from the year 1700 onwards, uh, India's economic growth was marked with stagnation, even retrogression, um, up to the attainment of India's independence in 1947 and becoming a republic in 1950. After 1950, 
you know, India embarked on the so-called planned economic development and for the first 40 years, from 1951 to 1990, roughly speaking, for the four decades, what was the average rate of economic growth? The average real GDP growth rate of India was only 3.5%. This was very impressive given the fact that earlier for the entire century, there was zero growth. So this 3.5% for 40 years, from 1951 to 1990, uh, was very low. 3.5% real GDP growth. During this period, the India's population was growing at the rate of 2.2% per year, which meant that the per capita income was rising at a measly rate of 1.3% per year, which meant that it would have taken India 55 years to double its per capita income, double its standard of living. India's first prime minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, had envisioned before independence that every 10 years, it would be our endeavor to double our standard of living. This was clearly belied uh, in the first 40 years after independence. From 1951 to 1990, we grew at the rate of only 3.5%, and the per capita income was rising at the measly rate of 1.3%. Uh, 1991, there was an unprecedented macroeconomic crisis in India, which made us change our policy stance. We changed the policy stance. There was a massive dose of liberalization, part privatization, globalization. Uh, led by Dr. Manmohan Singh as the finance minister. And after that, India has not looked back. First 10 years of reform, 1992 to 2002, India's average growth rate was 6%. 2002 to 2005, India's growth rate was 8%. And 2005 to 2008, India's average growth was more than 9% per year, which was remarkable. And by the year 2008, India had emerged as the second fastest growing country in the world, next only to China. But when there was great meltdown in United States emanating from the uh, uh, subprime crisis, uh, that's when, when United States went into deep recession, when the Western European countries and Japan went into deep recession, India and China were also affected, but India's growth rate was shaved off about 2.5% from their growth rate. From 9.3% in 2008, it came down to 6.9%. It bounced back rather quickly. It bounced back very quickly, and we were on the 8% growth path when yet another crisis hit us, that was the Eurozone crisis. Again, there was a slowdown a little bit, and we have bounced back. Today, India is growing at the rate of 7.5% per year, uh, which, is, which happens to be the fastest uh, growth in the, in the world among all the large economies. So we are not doing too badly today at 7.5% growth, although it is below the potential. I envision that in the next few years, it is not difficult, it is not impossible. It is difficult, challenging, but it is possible that India can attain 10% growth or more. Now, how does the caste figure in here? It's very important. You know, and this is the question that I had asked many people, that India's share in the global production, once upon a time, was 31.5%. Now, in 1991, when we were at the lowest ebb of our economic life, it was less than, less, about 1.5%. What explains this precipitous fall? Many explanations are given, but to my mind, the most powerful explanation is simply the prevalence of the caste system in our country. Why? The, it's common sense answer is very simple. There's no rocket science involved here, no model involved here. Very simple. In any country, in any society, when only 3 to 3.5 percent people have access to education and access to doing something out of their life for themselves, for their family, and for their nation, and the remaining 96.5 percent are destined, they are forced to take up vocation based on their caste, irrespective of their talent, irrespective of their potential, irrespective of their skills. How can that society grow? Just imagine how many Einsteins must have been born in that 96.5% population. But all of them had to do menial jobs if they were born in those castes. This is not the case where the families, those families lost. The nation has lost. And the caste system has done irreparable damage to us. Today, what is the situation is, looking at the future, India also has many headwinds to face. And we are facing them. However, we have one great advantage today, and that is demographic dividend. India's average age today is about 24 years, 
by the year 2020, average age of India would be 29 years. When India in 2020 is 29 years median age, at that time, the US median age would be 37, China's median age would be 38, Western Europe's median age would be 42, and Japan's median age would be 48, 49. Which means that today, in going into the future, India has this unique opportunity of demographic dividend. We have a large and growing young population. While in the next 20 years, there would be a worldwide shortage of personnel, India would be the only country which will have the labor force to provide. But this demographic dividend, which is going to promote, propel India into a double digit, potentially double digit growth trajectory, is not automatic. For this, we need to harness this demographic dividend. And the only way that I can see this demographic dividend can be harnessed in India today is by investing in education and in skill development. This is what is recognized. And if we do not do that, not only we would be squandering away this once in a lifetime opportunity for India, but we would be, the future generations will never forgive us because the demographic dividend would be turned into a demographic nightmare. We would be only producing mouths to feed, but not the hands that can work. And that would be an unmitigated disaster. And demographic dividend can potentially become a demographic disaster. And that is why we are focusing more and more on education and skill development. Uh, that is what is the situation. I will take only three more minutes to give concluding remarks. I think I should drink water again. <laughs> the largest democracy in the world that is the United States and the most popular democracy that is India have a very different historical evolution and are very differently placed in terms of future economic growth. While the US economy is facing a further protracted slowdown, the Indian economy is poised for achieving a double-digit growth in the none too distant future. Yet, despite of being positioned so differently, they seem to have strikingly similar imperatives for public policy. While the United States economy has traditionally been circumscribed by the rational, racial and ethnic diversity, India's Long-term economic growth has been held back for long by social stratification in terms of caste relations. While the United States can arrest its slowdown to an extent by policy imperatives focused on closing the racial divide, India can foster and sustain its high growth trajectory by all inclusive public policies. Failure Failure to consciously resort to inclusivity in both cases is likely to hurt their prospects for future economic growth. In absence of inclusivity, the US economy would seem unlikely to be able to arrest its future slowdown, while under the same circumstances, in the absence of inclusivity, inclusivity the Indian economy would seem unlikely to be able to sustain its high growth trajectory for long, even if it is achieved in the near future. So achieving that 10% magical growth rate is difficult, but not impossible. Sustaining that would be the big challenge. And there is no way, even if we achieve double digit growth rate, there is no way we can sustain it unless this growth is inclusive. That is the message that I want to give. So inclusive growth going beyond caste divide in India and the racial divide in the United States seems to be the panacea for both of these great countries, India and the United States. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. John, that was, that was excellent. We're going to go, we're going to go ahead with the Q&A. Okay, please do. Have you ever seen that? For the question and uh, answer, uh, we would ask uh, those of you who would like to address a question to Dr. Jadov to line up at the microphone 
that's over to my right, your left. Um, Dr. Jadov would prefer to uh, jot down uh, the question, questions as they are asked, uh, and then after we've had uh, several questions, uh, Dr. Jadov will answer them uh, in that order. Okay. Please identify yourself and ask question. Is it on? Here we go. Thank you. Uh, Russell Valentino, I'm a um, professor in Slavic and East European languages and cultures here. I have a, um, I've been thinking about this thesis a lot lately that was advanced by um, a legal scholar and historian by the name of Mary Dudziak in a book called Cold War Civil Rights. And uh, the thesis that um, the global dimensions of the Cold War, particularly the existence of the USSR, put a kind of pressure on the federal government of the US to put pressure on the states in turn, given the global competition that the US and the Soviet Union were currently engaged in throughout the 20th century, most of it. Um, and the pressure was to treat our minorities better. Um, in effect, we were looking at Asia, we were looking at Africa, and we were looking at Latin America as areas where the US could have an, a particular kind of, of, of influence. And the USR, USSR was doing the same thing, offering an alternative system, and in many cases, we were losing the battle, and so this pressure to, to do better domestically was a kind of constant that the US faced. And I suppose I've been thinking about it a lot lately because the test case would be to consider what would happen at, in a post-Cold uh, War environment in terms of the treatment of minorities in the, USS, in the US today, and I wonder if we aren't sort of seeing that. What is the result of a post-Cold War world. My question for you is, you talked about the economic changes um, post-1989, post-1990 approximately. You didn't talk about the social changes so much except for the battle against the caste system. And I'm wondering if the fall of the USSR did not make that battle more difficult or if it had other unforeseen um, consequences in India that you might be able to address. Hello, Zadov, sir. Uh, I be belong to the same village which Patrick was talking about. Uh, I belong to Ozer. So, really? Yeah. Look at the probability of this happening. <laughs> from my village in India, there are 700,000 villages. And somebody from my village in India happens to meet me in America at Indiana University. That is what I call homecoming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you talked about inclusive uh, growth, and currently India has around 50% of reservation in educational and political system uh, for all the all the categories, uh, s the lower categories specifically. So I just wanted to ask, like nowadays, every other caste in India wants reservation in educational and and political system. So do you think it is an hindrance to the economic or the social growth of the country? Thank you. Okay. Please tell me your name. My name is Ashutosh Bhargave. Ashutosh. Yeah, please. Uh, Kevin. Hi, hi, hi. In, in fact, I'll give you a, another coincidence. Uh, when Dr. Mbetker was converting the 700,000 Dalits to Buddhism, that was exactly the day I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, here, the question I wanted to ask you relates both to the, the strength of cultural ideas about race as well as about caste. Uh, I mean, we found in the United States that overturning racial ideology is extraordinarily difficult. And it seems to me it would also be even more difficult in India because that ideology has been around for such a very long time. So when you talked about the need to have inclusive development, you talked only about education, but you didn't really talk about how cultural ideology based upon the caste system would be overcome in order to allow that 
inclusive development to occur. Uh, so I guess my question to you is, how will you bring about the inclusive development in, in the inclusion of, of, of Dalits uh, as well as scheduled tribes uh, in this new economy? Thank you. I am George von Furstenberg, College of Arts and Sciences, Economics. I'm very interested in what in the news reports we are getting lately about currency reform in India. And it occurs to me that there are two types of currency reforms, or uh, about two that need to be a model whereby you simply adjust the currency amounts, but there's no redistribution. Examples, of course, are uh, the, in France, the Nouveau Franc was replacing the Ancien Franc, and uh, there was no redistribution involved. Uh, there was, uh, everything was simply redenominated in the new currency, and if you try to take on two digits, and, and uh, uh, that is a non-distributive currency reform, and then there's a redistributive one, which I think the Indian currency reform uh, has clearly redistributive elements, as far as I know so far. But an example of that would be Germany's uh, currency reform of 1948, where uh, uh, the essential element of the reform was that the old currency was set aside and a fixed amount adjusted only for demographics such as number of children in the family and so forth was paid to each of the citizens in the new currency. And then there was sort of a consolation prize that instead of having to use the old currency to heat your home, you were given a very, very bad exchange rate on the remaining currency, on the old currency that was adjusted. Thank you. Um, Hi, Mr. Jadav. Uh, my name is Rishad Unwala. Um, I actually went for one year to Ruria, where you did your BSc. <laughs> uh, this is a day of coincidences. He has gone to the same college in Mumbai where I went. Um, so yeah. my question is regarding the caste system. Mm -hmm. You spoke primarily how Hinduism, um, the caste system in Hinduism would affect the economy, but uh, India is a nation of many religions like Jainism, Zoroastrianism, Islam. And I just wanted to know whether the caste system was also present in these other religions, mm. and why is it not as prevalent or not spoken about as much? Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Sir, my name is Ishita Gugnani. I am also from India, and I'm a law student. Um, my question is that when we talk about a policy based on inclusion, um, in the long term, is it uh, actually helpful to create a system of reservations, uh, considering that our religious scriptures say otherwise, especially Hindu scriptures, and whether creating a special system of reservations would also apply to the US and whether a system is functional in the long term? Good evening, Mr. Jadav, and thank you for the illuminating talk that you delivered today. It was really inspiring. Uh, I'm a law and public policy student, so my question is policy-centric as such. Um, I was just wondering, considering the uh, caste-based affirmative action policy in India right now, what challenges do you think uh, the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in India face today in breaking the shackles of the caste system? Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions, so we'd okay. be delighted to hear your answers Okay. Now. Before I uh, start responding to the question, thank you. Thank you for all these questions. Uh, before I start responding to the questions, I must uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of two of my teachers. Uh, one of them actually asked a question here, uh, Professor von Fustenberg, who are the chairman of my uh, uh, PhD research committee, and uh, Professor Lloyd Orr, uh, who, was, who was also there. I think you didn't get a chance to uh, ask questions. Uh, you have questioned me enough, right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, let me turn to uh, the questions. Uh, thank you for all these questions. Uh, the first question was about uh, cold, uh, cold War, and whether the fall of USSR uh, has made uh, any difference in the battle uh, of caste system in India. No. Uh, it has, in a way, uh, you know, what your thesis was saying, 
that fall of USSR directly may not have an impact, but I look at it as, 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 the, as the turning point uh, because what happened in the 1990 and 1991 is that for two sets of factors, the world economy started changing very rapidly. We all know that the only thing constant in life is change, but the pace of change truly accelerated. What happened, uh, my understanding is that um, on the political side, balkanization and breakdown of USSR, the coming down of the Berlin Wall and so on, and on the technology side, revolutionary advances in computers, electronics, telecommunications, and so on. And the combined result of these two sets of factors, uh, the world economy started changing very rapidly. And I dare say that the change that brought about, that took place in the last 10 years of the last century, it was more or equal to the change that had taken place in 100 years before that. So the pace of change has accelerated. With the acceleration of change of pace, you know, what, would ha what happened was, Precisely at the same time, Indian economy entered into crisis for completely different reasons. And so the turning point for the world economy coincided with the turning point for India, uh, but for entirely different reasons. After we were awakened by the shock, you know, the situation was so bad, the gro economic growth was negative, inflation rate was 17%, and uh, our foreign exchange reserves had dwindled to a level of less than $1 billion. So we were on the brink of a default. India has always had an impeccable track record of honoring all our uh, external obligations, but we came very close to default at that time. And there was no country to help us, no IMF, no World Bank, nobody was willing to help us. So that was a big crisis, and we, after that, there was a change of government, and we had to actually uh, mortgage 47 tons of our gold to tide over the difficulties. But then there was a change of government, Manmohan Singh government, I mean the... In India, liberalization, part privatization, and globalization, abbreviated as LPG. Earlier, LPG always meant liquefied petroleum gas. But in India, when you talk about LPG, you're talking about liberalization, part privatization, and globalization. So the economy has completely changed. The competition has increased. The concept of our person, you know, somebody is my man. You know, earlier that meant the caste to which the person belonged. Now, it doesn't mean our man is not the man who belongs to my caste. Man, our man is one man who is contributing to the profitability of my, my, uh, my, my uh, enterprise. That slowly but surely, that kind of change is taking place, and that is helping. So one cannot link directly what has happened in the fall of USSR directly with what is happening in the social battle in India. But yes, in the general equilibrium, they are all interrelated. Uh, there was another question about reservation, uh, that every caste is asking for reservation. Is that, Ashutosh's question, is that a hindrance? There were two questions on reservation. I'm going to take both of them together. Uh, there was this question about uh, caste-based reservations and what are the challenges faced by Dalits in removing or throwing away the shackles of caste system? Uh, is the reservation the way? Please understand why do we need reservation? You know, they, they, this is a subject of big debate in India, uh, but basically reservations are needed because, in my view, reservations are needed because of the innate inability of our system to be just and fair. If the system were just and fair, we don't need any reservations. But as long as the system remains just unjust and unfair, we are going to need reservation. And let me also tell you that the reservation only applies to the government jobs, and not many jobs are coming up in the government. Now there is a demand that the reservation should be there in the private sector as well. And how private is private sector in India? Not a whole lot. 
So if they are taking concessions in different forms from the government, they must also accept the social obligation of reservation. Now that is currently a big debate that is going on. So in my opinion, while there is a continuous talk about uh, whether reservations are necessary and there is the injustice done to so many, I have to also mention to you that reservation policy has been very poorly implemented. When I convert this book, this, this speech into a book, which I hope to do in the next couple of years, I'm going to write a separate chapter on comparing the implementation of affirmative action policy in India and comparing it with uh, affirmative action implementation of affirmative action policy in the United States. I'm not sure about the United States, but I can tell you the implementation of affirmative action policy in India is awfully poor. So Dalits like me are having a double whammy. There are a lot of people who feel that so much is being given to them, so much appeasement is being done, while as a matter of fact, very little is being done about that. I will also give you an example. There is a very good plan in India, a very good project, very good scheme called Scheduled Caste Subplan that was introduced by Indira Gandhi as the Prime Minister in 1975. It basically says that from the planned expenditure, you must government, central government as well as states must earmark must earmark certain minimum amount of funding for the scheduled caste and for scheduled tribe, not less than their share in the total population. Now, that makes sense. Now, if, if that is done, present disparity between scheduled caste, scheduled tribes on one hand and others, that would be maintained to close that actually there should be proportionately more expenditure made on scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. So scheduled castes are 16.8% of the total population. 40 years after that scheme, how much is the amount which is actually uh, earmarked for the scheduled caste? When I took over as a member planning commission, it was 6.8%. And after a lot of struggle and efforts from within the system, I could raise it to 9.5%. But we are still far away from 16.8%. Same thing about the tribals. So there is a big difference between, I'll tell you something really shocking, appalling. You know, there is a financial subhead also open or supposed to be open for keeping these funds, etc. And that has been provided for. In 2010, when I surveyed the thing, the scheme which came in 1975 and 1979 for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, 40 years thereafter, how many of the 68 ministries had opened that financial subhead? You'll be surprised. One. After 40 years, that shows the apathy, that shows the appalling situation in the terms of ground realities. So there is a lot more needs to be done to effectively implement what has been given. So that is where the problem is. So when the people ask me question about whether the reservation should continue, my immediate answer is first you implement what you are giving. And then we will think about how, what it happens, how it goes in future. So I'm a strong supporter of reservation, even reservation in the private sector. Uh, Kevin uh, raised the issue about uh, how to bring about inclusive development going beyond the caste. Uh, and why focus only on education? Uh, education is a transformational device, and one needs to go beyond that. But most important thing is, most important thing about the caste is that, you know, in India, you know, one of the difference between the racial system in America and the caste system in India is that in America, even an outsider can tell a difference. You know, physical looks, appearance, color, everything is different. In India, even an insider will not be able to do that differentiation beyond the point. So how do we differentiate? We differentiate based on the names. You know, the names often tell the story of which caste, high or low caste, one belongs to. That is why in the next few months, I'm going to introduce a private member's bill in the upper house of the Indian parliament that we should scrap the surnames. There should not be any surname. You know, the name, surname can come from, the family name can come from the place where you are coming from. That should be good enough. Right now, the surnames and family names indicate high or low caste. And so people recognize each other not by their respective capabilities, but by the caste that they belong. You know, when Indian gets together, President Sir, 
When the Indians get together, when they ask each other questions, how are you, where are you from, when they start asking these questions, actually there is only one question Indian is asking. What is your caste? Believe it or not, all those questions are leading. Only when you know the caste of the other person, you know where to classify him and then you are comfortable. Because you know how to deal with that person. This is unfortunately a reality. So first of all, we must learn to look at each other as individuals, not as a particular caste. Because the stereotypes based on caste are, are horrible. You know, if you permit me, I know it is quite late. Can I take one minute to give an example? You know, I have an intercaste marriage. My wife is so-called high caste and I'm a low caste. Now my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, did not attain our wedding. She had seen two Dalit families near her, perfectly nice person, reasonably educated, middle class, uh, and she had two Dalit families known. In both families, she had seen that the, the man would get drunk, invariably get drunk every evening and go, go home and beat up on his wife. She had seen only two families. You know, we call it a small sample error, right? So she was convinced that the same thing is going to happen to her, her daughter. And therefore, she did not attend our wedding. Later on, I became her favorite son-in-law. And, uh, and you know, interesting thing is, she and my mother, they came from different worlds altogether. But they became such thick friends when they went beyond the obvious. You know, it took many years. But when they looked at each other as human beings, without the glass of the caste, you know, I have not seen any two individuals being more friendly than these two women were. So much so that my mother-in-law named after her granddaughter after my mother. This is the biggest tribute that you can pay in India. And that happened because she went beyond the caste. Finally, she went beyond the caste. The same person who had boycotted our wedding. So the point is, we have to first learn to look at each other going beyond the caste based on the person that he or she is. Now that is, I think, essential requirement for the inclusive development that you are talking about. Uh, then there was, uh, Nishita asked a question about whether in the long run uh, reservations, whether they are needed. Yes, I, I have answered that. They are very much needed as long as the system is unjust and unfair. If the system is just and fair, we don't need any reservation. So you make the system just and fair, and we will not need any reservation. But until that happens, reservations would be needed. Finally, I come to the question uh, by my teacher, Professor von Fustenberg. This is not related to uh, the subject. However, it is my teacher, so I have to answer that question. Uh, you know, the, the example that you gave, sir, about uh, Germany in 1948 is very illuminating. Um, that is. It, the kind of currency reform, what currency reform that he's talking about took place, you know what they were saying in India. When United States was counting votes, India was counting notes. This was the slogan given there because on the day of election here, uh, the day of announcement, uh, counting uh, an announcement, uh, India had a major currency reform which took everybody by surprise. The 500 rupee and 1000 rupee notes were announced that they would cease to be legal tender and the, those currency notes uh, right now they're in the process of new currency notes are being issued uh, for 5,000 500 rupees as well as an entirely new series of 2,000 rupees currency notes and this is a historic uh, moment uh, but here you know the, the what what uh, the government is trying to do is a kind of surgical strike on two things sir uh, I do not know the circumstances uh, in Germany when 1948 reforms took place. But in India, we have done that for two reasons. One is a very large unaccounted money, which we call black money. And second one is a large amount of counterfeit money, which comes into India from our friendly neighbor through Nepal, and which goes to finance the terrorism. So the idea is, you know, uh, among the black money, or black money means uh, the money which is, which is unaccounted for, one which is not taxed, that among, the, as a part of, very large part of black money is simply stashed in the house. 
you know, uh, hiding under the pillows and uh, bed sheets and bed covers and even ceiling and floors. In, there are innovative ways of stacking the money. Large part of black money is actually in circulation in the sectors like construction sector. Nothing is going to happen there. But to the money which is accumulated by corrupt bureaucrats, by corrupt politicians, and by unscrupulous businessmen, which has been stacked inside the house or in godowns hidden away somewhere, that has suddenly become completely scrap. Does that mean poor people will suffer? A lot of people are complaining poor people will suffer. No, not at all. They would be inconvenienced. Yes, that too for a very short time. They will all be able to convert their currency notes into new notes. They can deposit it in the bank. What will happen is that when any individual goes to a bank to deposit his or her money, if the amount that he or she is depositing is way out of line with his known sources of income, questions would be asked and income tax authorities would be informed. So this is making it difficult for anybody to keep cash without paying the tax. That is a simple thing. As far as the fake notes are concerned, the currency counterfeit notes are concerned, uh, there are factories running and large amount of money which is going to, which is financing the terrorism in India and that will also be a big setback to that effort. Now this is again uh, only temporary in the sense that it will have positive effect, uh, it will improve the financial inclusion, it, it will be improving the financial inclusion by a quantum jump would be there, there would be larger amount of revenues that government will get and in India at least larger amount of black money is also associated with larger amount, larger extent of inflation. Uh, and therefore, to the extent that we succeed in arresting the further growth of black money, sir, it would also mean containing to that extent the level of inflation. And inflation, as we know, is the, as you have taught me, sir, is uh, the most iniquitous form of taxation which hurts the poor the most. And therefore, this is going to be anti-inflationary or has, is going to have an effect of abatement of inflation as well, which means that, to my mind, although I do not belong to BJP, the ruling party, I have re chosen to remain independent, I can say that this is strategically a very important decision which has been taken, a truly a historic decision, and the level of secrecy which was retained, you know, in India it is not it's very unusual to retain secrecy for so long at that level. You know, only five or six people knew about this and it was executed with perfection. So I think it is a great move and um, it will certainly augur very well for the future evolution of India's economic growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you, sir. And, and you only needed... Two or three drinks of water to get through that. <laughs> uh, we would like to invite everybody to uh, stay and uh, talk about many of the topics that were raised tonight. There's food and drink. The reception will be at the rear of the room. Uh, but before uh, we do that, would you all please join me one more time in thanking Dr. Giotto.